Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is Matt uh, from CLOC. I am the marketing manager. Uh, welcome, all of you, to today's webinar. Uh, we have Mike Kinnerman and Nicola Waller, Walker, I'm sorry, uh, from DSM, and they're going to be talking to us today about uh, Bovair and their experience uh, with using green feed and reducing uh, methane emissions in ruminants. So just a quick introduction. Uh, Mike Kinnerman is the inventor of the methane inhibitor 3-NOP, Bovair, uh, and heading the R&D program for the project Clean Cow. Uh, chemist by training with a background in molecular biology, he's working with his team to bring cutting-edge technology into the animal nutrition and health sector uh, with a focus on sustainability. Nicola, Nicola Walker is the leading animal trials uh, is leading the animal trials for the project Clean Cow. And as a rumen microbiologist and animal scientist, she brings an understanding of the impact that 3NOP has on the rumen microbiome and how this methane mitigator can reduce methane emissions and influence animal performance. Thank you both of you for being here today. And um, I will turn it over to you. Thanks a lot. I hope everybody can hear me. So warm welcome also from us, the DSM team, so from Nicola and myself. Um, our program today is to guide you through the development history of 3NOP with the trade name Bobair. Maybe some of you have joined already the webinar in 2019 when we introduced the name Bobair to everyone, the outside world. We had a busy day today also because maybe some of you have seen that we have released the press release showing again great results from a dairy trial at uh, Wagen University, you know, in the, in the Dutch system. And also our co-CEO Geraldine Maché was talking on CNBC about the sustainability program from DSM, the commitment that we have as a company to also support the livestock sector, you know, the entire value chain, also the farmers in being part of the journey to fight climate change and being an, a contributor to climate change mitigation strategies. And in this context, we entitled the, the presentation today as a novel, novel feed ingredient Vovea enables significant reduction of methane emission from ruminants. Now, Vovea, that's the name. Looks a little bit odd here in the second part of the word, so we'd like to explain where the name is coming from. So it's a combination between bovine and air. But we cannot put it as bovine and air together because then everybody would think we are an airline. That's of course not what we are, maybe it causes even legal problems. So we did a little twist and came up with the name Bovair. That's the brand name. It might be that for the US we, we have to find another one. But uh, currently, for the rest of the world, or for most of the regions, that's the trade name of um, our feed ingredient, or feed additive. Now, <clears throat> we normally would like to state the word need cows. Probably not so much needed the audience here, because I assume you're all from uh, the sector. You're very well aware what the value is that the ruminants, specifically also dairy cows, are bringing to us. First, they are valuable converters of things that we cannot eat, and therefore they really nourish us. They nourish the world because dairy products are on our table, on my table for breakfast very often. Living in Switzerland, of course, the Swiss cheese is very famous, so uh, we all enjoy and need dairy products. And let's not forget that billions of people have their jobs in this agricultural environment. So um, they also support um, billions of livelihoods that are related to dairy production. So we are big cow lovers, cow supporters. That needs to be clear right from the beginning. When you look into the footprint of a liter of milk, by source, and this is a global number, and we well recognize that there are regional differences in these numbers, but on the global average published by the FAO in 2018, you see 
what contributes to the footprint of a liter or kilogram of um, milk? The surprising fact for me when I joined DSM in 2008 was enteric methane accounts for roughly 50%. It's the largest, the single largest contributor to the carbon footprint of a liter of milk. And then you have on the right hand side also the manure management, energy, feeds, and so on. But enteric methane, that's the largest contributor. And then tackling this one and working on a project that addresses or trying to reduce enteric methane will, of course, have a huge impact on the footprint of a liter of milk. And we, that, that's what we are aiming for. This is a map of Europe just highlighting what's happening around um, the pledges of being carbon neutral, reduce carbon emission. This is also a picture that has evolved when the project Clean Cow and all our development started 11, 12 years ago. This map would have been more or less empty. And now it's um, getting more and more crowded because more and more countries, regions, the public and the private sector are making pledges to become to become carbon neutral, um, reducing carbon emissions. And when you go from, from left to right, you see that the United Kingdom, Tesco, a big retailer in the UK, the Netherlands, that's um, also related to the press release today, is um, setting targets, Finland Campina, Norway is setting targets to, to you know, to the public to become carbon neutral in 2030. ALA, for example, Finland, um, the, the company Valio, and it's all publicly available on the internet. The known, long-lasting uh, fighting for, for carbon neutrality, Barry Calibout, Chocolate, and also Neste, I think three weeks ago, made a huge announcement for carbon neutrality in 2050. So we are in good company, and the world is picking up this urgent question on carbon neutrality and climate change. And this is, of course, where we are. This is the playing field where we are in. And we are happy that we are gaining more and more traction in, in uh, providing a method to, re to make these carbon strategies real. Now, this is the journey of Beauvais, a slide that we also presented when we launched the trade name Beauvais. It starts at DSM in 2008. This is also the year when I joined DSM, so it's also a bit of a personal journey that you're seeing here. But it's very important for us to emphasize that there was a lot of research going on in reducing methane emission from ruminants um, even 30, 40, 50 years before. And we were building on all the knowledge that has been gained in this time. Initially, 40, 50 years ago, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions were not so high on the radar screen as they are today. But people were thinking more direct. Methane is associated with a lot of energy loss to the cow between the, the literature values ranging between two, three, four percent up to 12 percent. And people thought, hey, if we can save some of this energy in reducing methane emission, we can help in on the productivity side of the cow, meat, and milk. So people have tested dietary effects, have tested lipids, plant extracts, essential oils, and a bit more complicated long-term programs like breeding programs and vaccine programs. So you can say, so why the hell is DSM joining now a race or an effort when so much things have already been worked out? We felt when we started in 2008, under this big project umbrella, climate change induced innovation, Project Clean Cow. Because DSM said, if, oh, and our former CEO and chairman, Fike Sibisma, was pushing a lot, saying if we don't address climate change, also as a private company, we will not be future proof um, in our operations. So when I joined <clears throat> to the team, we said, why don't we? And that might have been a bit naive, but sometimes that's also a key success factor. Why don't we develop our own inhibitor? And let's see how far we get. So literally, we started at, in January 2009 working, testing things that could reduce um, methane. 
way. One of the questions when we launched the trade in Beauvais that we got very often is, when was Beauvais made for the first time? So we went back to our books. And I can tell you here precisely that on April 10th, 2010, Beauvais, we had it for the first time in our hands. The way the research works is you test all the things that you, you intend to develop as a methane inhibitor first in vitro in a test tube. So we tested a lot of things. And then Beauvais came out as, as the leading um, candidate. And the first animal trial we ever did with this um, Beauvais was in also in 2010, later in 2010, in Spain with uh, David Yanez. Um, and we got the results in the written format um, in February 2011. And then we immediately said, can we translate this also, this good results in methane reduction into dairy cows? The next trial was done at the University of Reading with Chris Reynolds. And yes, we saw that we can also reduce methane in dairy cows. Of course, the next question is, hey, what about beef cattle? So together with Karen Bushma at Lesbridge, in Lesbridge, um, Alberta, Canada, we were setting up the next trial, successful. And then we had the confidence that we have a methane inhibitor that works in all ruminants. Then I thought, coming from a different area, that's it, we have a product, job done. And then I learned that everybody said, hey, my cows are different, my feeding system is different, will it work here and there and there? So there's a long period where we supported trials around the world, and you will see the slide later, to get confidence that this Beauvais is working in all kinds of settings. And we have so far not a single trial that failed. So it always works and in all feeding systems. We go into the details later. In 2015, we said, hey, that, that seems to get real. Can we make this in large scale? And this is something the ASM is very good at. Yes, we can. So uh, that, that was procured. And in 2016, we said we need now to start all the registration trials to fulfill all the requirements also from data quality for the authorities. Also major lifting, we did it and we handed in the registration dossier uh, for market authorization first in Europe in 2019. We're waiting now for, for the market approval this year. So that's the journey. Now, this slide shows a bit from a context perspective how we explain Beauvais to a less scientific audience. So the first thing is that we say cow are making methane, it's not their fault. Methane is a byproduct of the fermentation process, it takes place in the rumen, maybe you see my, my uh, cursor, in the rumen and um, it's basically a way for the cow to get rid of the excess of hydrogen that's formed during this fermentation process. Methane is then leaving the cow via burping out, and we need constantly educate the rest of the world. And I also remember when Alex Histroff gave the late last um, um, webinar here in this area for, for CLOC, he also said that's one of his uh, constant jobs to educate people. This methane, it's a burping out, it's not about farting. So 95% of the methane is leaving the cow on the front side. Methane trap seed, <clears throat> it's a very potent greenhouse gas. To make things more tangible and also comparable, people have found a way to convert the global warming potential of methane into CO2 equivalents, so that you can compare the amount of CO2 and methane. And as a factor, the current accepted factor is, I think, 28 or 34. There is also time element in. And for those of you who are following on Twitter and social media, the discussion um, led by Frank Mitlöner um, from UC Davis, there's a big debate on what's, what's the right factor. But of course, the factor is quite high. So that's what we use later on. We convert methane into CO2 equivalents. What people don't really know, it's also good to highlight it here, we get the question, how much or where do you need to feed a cow on a daily basis? To make the, the scientific answer is between one and 1.5 grams per animal a day. What does it mean, 1.5 1, 1. grams? So we have a form, you know, formulation, powder, free-flowing powder. And to make it more tangible, we say one quarter of a teaspoon daily. 
that resonates with everybody. A quarter of a teaspoon is easy to imagine. Then we say it reduces methane by 30%. Very important for you to know is the effect is immediate. And when I say immediate, I mean 20 minutes, 30 minutes later, methane is down. And you don't need to feed this for weeks to see an effect, it's immediate. It's proven safe for consumers and for cows. So we have gone through the extensive um, safety evaluation that's even required or it's required by authorities. And we say it's good for our planet. How it works, I will highlight on the next slide. It's a very specific inhibitor that suppresses the enzyme that is responsible for the last step of methanogenesis. Now we are getting with two slides into a bit of a detail. Methane is produced in the microbiome of a cow by a specific form of microorganisms, the archaea. And the biological process is in a cascade of seven enzymatic steps, CO2 is converted with hydrogen to methane. This picture is taken from a review article from the science community in New Zealand. Very good overview article. Highly recommended to read for those of you who are interested in. We ask ourselves at which step, step in this process can we best influence the process and reduce the mass information of these archaea that you know this that the circle is representing the archaea. We decided to tackle the last step of this methanogenesis for two reasons. One reason is the crystal structure of this protein was published in 1997 by Uli Amler and Rolf Tauer and the, the, the group at the Max Planck Institute in uh, Germany, Marburg. The other very important topic is that this enzyme, methylcholine reductase, only appears in these microorganisms and nowhere else in the cow. So the reason that we had in mind is if we tackle this one, we won't probably see any unwanted side effects anywhere else in the cow. That was the starting point in 2008, 2009. Now, 10, 11, 12 years later, I can tell you this is true. <laughs> so we have proven all the details. The starting point was, was already good. Um, now, after having the good animal results achieved, we also said we need to prove that the story that I presented you in the slide before is correct. And we teamed up with, I mentioned Rolf Tower, the Max Planck Institute in Marburg, and for example, Eber Duin, who is a professor at Auburn University, and together we tackle this question, what's the mode of action? And we published the result in 2016 in PNAS, high-ranked scientific journal. And the interesting thing is we learned also something that we didn't know. Over at the molecule 3NOP, it's shown here. And the interesting thing is while it's reducing methane, it gets cleaved into two natural fragments that are present in the cow anywhere. That also explained why we don't find Bovea 3 NOP anywhere in the cow or in the milk. Initially, we thought or we could face the criticism, hey, you don't look good enough. But now, since we know that the compound gets cleaved while it acts on methanogens, it's clear that we don't find it anymore. So it's become a traceless inhibitor. I'm not going into all the details here because um, that, that takes too long. But one thing that I wanted to highlight is the effect is fully reversible. So if we stop feeding Bovea, methane production goes back to normal. And a consequence of this is we also prove that we don't kill microorganisms. We only reduce their activity. We have proven the efficacy of Bovea extensively globally. And here you see an overview of um, the world map, the trial sites, and also a few, highlighted a few of the results. Let me quickly start here in Europe. We have, as of today, finished 17 trials. We have reached 41% of methane reduction. I said it's uh, dose and diet dependent. We are aiming for 30%. If we increase the dose, we can go higher. But that's, that's what we are targeting. We also have finished a large uh, one-year trial on the commercial dairy to see, you know, is it applicable in a commercial setting and do we see the long-lasting effect of Bovea? And yes, we do. We also moved to North America. Um, we have finished eight beef and seven 
erythrites there. Here you see a higher methane reduction number, up to 82%. All data that you see here are published, and that indicates that the diet 3NOP for their interaction is um, important. And with all the trials, we are now also able to predict the methane outcome if we know the details of the diets and the dose that is applied. We have finished the largest beef cattle trial, 15,000 heads in Canada. Um, also announced this in November or December last year, so also publicly available. Latin America, we did some trials, reached 55% um, methane reduction, one beef and one dairy trial. And of course, Oceania, long lasting relationship with the scientific community and, and also the, the industry in, in uh, New Zealand and also in Australia. And we finished uh, beef and dairy trials in this region on, and reached 55%. The picture above shows you 43 trials finished as of today. We are publishing all our results. So you see we are keeping up 38 or 39 scientific papers out there right now. And uh, the rest is coming. So we have still more publications on our hard drive that we need to read, go to the approval process and publish 13 countries. And we already saved 2,000 tons of CO2 equivalents during these trials, which um, makes us proud. And I think with this one, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Nicola Walker, who will guide you through the details of the animal trials. I don't know who switched the slides. Hi. Voila. Hi, good. everybody. <laughs> I hope everybody can hear me okay, and uh, I'm just going to get into presentation mode. This is this is always the problem of moving from a a um, moving from your your sort of like uh, just just moving in between people. Having to be a tag team operation is really you know not great. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, in terms of the, the work we've done, as Mike said, the majority of the trials we have run have been using the green feed systems. Um, I've put on here a diagram of the green feed just for people who are not familiar with them. Um, and here you can see uh, the, the system itself. The animal is encouraged to go to visit the green feed. Uh, we put a very tasty bait in here. And even in this picture, you can see that the animals are actually queuing up to go and visit the green feed. They love them so much. And within the green feed itself, we have both methane and CO2 sensors. Um, some of the newer versions uh, that we've been using also have hydrogen sensors. The animal is identified by an RFID tag reader. And from this, um, we know which animal has visited and when it visited. Um, DSM has been involved with CLOC to actually get these uh, systems validated. And these have been now approved by both the FDA in the US and also EFSA in the EU as a rec recognized validated system to be able to measure um, methane emissions and the effects of methane inhibitors. If we move now to the dairy studies, um, and this is just an interesting slide that I thought people who use green feeds would be interested to see. Um, you can actually, if you collect enough data, you can actually measure the diurnal pattern of methane emissions measured by green feeds, exactly as you can do in a chamber system. So this is the study that was run at Penn State. There was 48 lactating cows. Uh, we had a three-week covariate period. I would also um, advise people to do a covariate period if you're going to do these type of studies. It gives you a very strong baseline measurement. And then we had 15 weeks of measures. Here we've plotted the time of day over a 24-hour period um, and the methane emissions in terms of grams per day. In this study, Bovera was mixed in uh, the PMR um, at 60 milligrams per kilogram dry matter which resulted in a 25% reduction in methane emissions. Now, because of the, you can see here for the large number of data points we've collected, in black, we have control. 
in blue, we have the Beauvais treated animals. Uh, we have periods, of course, twice a day when animals go for milking. So we, we don't actually get any measurements in that period. And these animals were fed fresh feed once a day. So you can see that very nice effect once they're fed, they've returned. Um, these animals also tend to visit the green feeds um, almost immediately after eating um, their, their PMR. It's almost like they're going for dessert. Uh, like a little cookie snack, a uh, little sugar rush, and we can get some really nice measurements where you can see that peak in methane rising over the course of the day. It then you know, levels out to where animals are keep going back and continually feeding. And then as we go after uh, evening milking, animals tend to settle down for the evening. They're not eating and we can see their methane going down. What you can see with the Beauvais treated animals, um, we see a, a, a good reduction. We never reach the same peak that we do in the control animals, and it stays fairly constant throughout the day. So this just shows you that you can use green feeds to, to actually look at diurnal patterns, providing you have enough data points. As Mike said, we've done a large number of different dairy studies. In total, we've done 14. Um, of these, within these, there's 26 different treatments. And, and by treatments, I mean different dose rates, uh, ranging from 40 milligrams per kilogram dry matter, um, all the way up to 150 milligrams per kilogram dry matter. And you can see that we have, uh, what I've done here is, if we look at the percent reduction um, and the dose of Beauvais, I've split them into three different groupings. Uh, one grouping is the below 60 milligram per kilogram dry matter, um, where the majority of our studies have been conducted. This is our minimum recommended dose. I then have 60 to 80, and then over 80 milligram per kilogram dry matter. And you can see an average reduction of 27% at that minimum dose. This increases to 34% reduction in the 60 to 80 range and we can go up to 44 percent reduction um, when we go higher so by having a recommended dose range of between 60 and 100 milligrams per kilogram dry matter we feel this gives you the flexibility to um, be able to adjust uh, the dose rate that you want um, to target the range of methane reduction that you would like you can see there is a degree of variability um, across uh, the different doses. Um, that is mainly due to diet changes. Uh, we find, for instance, if you have a very high NDF, high forage diet, your cow is going to produce more methane anyway. Um, so as a result, your, your starting point, your baseline is, is higher. So you may not get um, as high a methane reduction. Animals on a more kind of starch, uh, grain-fed diet, of course, we see a, a much greater impact. But overall, um, a minimum re uh, reduction of about 27% with the minimum recommended dose. If we actually look in terms of the relationship, as we increase the amount of Beauvais we feed, we can see an increase in the amount of uh, methane that we can save in terms of grams per day. And if we change this to CO2 equivalents, essentially feeding one cow one and a half grams of Beauvais per day will save approximately 1.3 tons of CO2 equivalents per year. So this can make a real difference in terms of the carbon footprint of the cow itself. Some of the other things, and as I just said, we can see some of this variability, um, particularly due to diet differences. Uh, these are three different uh, dairy studies that were conducted. Uh, we used exactly the same trial design, the same target dose. So really the differences were down to site, the diet, uh, particularly in terms of percentage of NDF, um, the type of roughage or forage that was being fed, uh, dry matter intake, a uh, level of milk production, and also the level of the initial methane production. So if we actually look here, the three different sites, we have a range in terms of the initial baseline methane from 360 grams per day to 460 grams per day. 
And a lot of this is differences due to the, the amount of NDF in the diet. Uh, so site one, for instance, uh, the NDF content there uh, was uh, 36%. In terms of um, the other studies, uh, site two was uh, 29% NDF, whereas site three was uh, also just over 28% NDF. Intakes were quite similar between site two and site three, uh, very high producing cows. Um, site one, uh, these animals were eating a little less um, and their milk production was a little lower. But in terms of the overall methane reduction we saw, um, in site one, we got a 22% reduction. In site two, a 25% reduction. And in site three, a 35% reduction. Now, these were highly significant with the p-value of 0 0.0001. And you know, sometimes it gets almost a little um, boring, I think is the way to say, because you know, with this product, we know it works every time. It works um, on every type of diet. Where the part that's interesting is that we can see some of these small dietary differences that can affect the percentage that we have. Another key, uh, interesting fact is as soon as we started feeding the, the bovaire, we see an immediate effect and a reduction in methane. So here we have the, the, the covariate period um, where animals are producing a lot of methane, and then we can see that reduction in terms of grams per day. Pretty immediate um, within the first week. We have similar levels across the whole 15 weeks, so we have a persistent effect. And as I said, uh, you know, these key differences that we have are driven mainly, we think, by um, diet composition and dry matter intake. And, you know, so that can change a little bit uh, the amount of grams of bovaire that these animals are eating. And we're really uh, continuing our research now to investigate these dietary effects and different interactions, um, either with um, giving different uh, forage levels, uh, different NDF levels, uh, different compositions or mixes of um, the, the corn silage to grass silage and uh, looking at other additives that we could maybe use in terms of having synergistic effects with the bovair on reducing the methane. Now, as Mike said, we've also done some work in beef cattle. It doesn't just work in um, dairy cows. You know, we've done studies now in dairy, uh, beef, sheep, um, goats. Uh, so as long as it's a ruminant and it's producing methane, uh, the bovair will work. So if we look in terms of the range, um, here we've got uh, 13 different beef studies have been uh, run. Uh, in different regions, so having different diets, so Canada, Australia, and Brazil. The type of diets, whether it's a backgrounding diet, so it tends to have a lot more forage in the diet, um, or the finishing diets, and these can be either uh, corn, barley, or wheat-based. And we can see some differences. So if we look at the backgrounding, we have uh, some of the backgrounding uh, diets here. We can see we don't get as big a percentage reduction as we get with the finishing diets. And we think some of that is maybe down to the fact that with that uh, higher NDF level, we can see um, you know, some of the, the methane, uh, you know, we can be getting uh, more methane being produced. But consistently, a nice reduction in terms of the methane. Uh, that's being produced uh, going from anything from 20% on some of those background diets all the way up to 80% on those finishing diets. And from this, we come up with the recommended dose ranges from between 125 to 200 milligrams per kilogram dry matter. Majority of the studies we've done have uh, the initial ones were done in respiration chambers. Uh, we've done one study in uh, using SF6. Uh, green feed systems, the large finishing beef study that um, but, um, Mike talked about there. Uh, we had small pen studies uh, held within the large feedlots, and here we also use laser grid-based measurements. Again, the conclusion is that dose rate, the, the growth phase, whether we're in backgrounding or finishing and diet, can impact the percentage of methane that we can achieve. But we get some very good effects. 
Another thing we've looked at was while this was another study to look in terms of persistency, uh, this was a study with eight beef heifers. Uh, they're fed a backgrounding diet. Uh, they were fed uh, uh, two grams of the Beauvais per day, which worked out at about uh, just over 200 milligrams per kilogram dry matter for a total of 112 days. Uh, there was a period, the covariate period here to get the baseline. The animals then entered the chambers uh, for four different periods. Uh, for three days, and we can see a consistent and persistent effect of the Beauvais in blue compared to the control group in black. And as soon as the Beauvais was removed from the diet at this point, we can see an immediate recovery. In this instance, the study, um, they achieved a 59%, uh, significant 59% reduction in methane. Uh, this continued throughout the study. There was no sign of adaptation, which is always a concern um, with some inhibitors where you might see a, a really good effect to start with, but then the rumen can adapt. We don't see that adaptation uh, with the, the Beauvais. And if we stop it, the effect was completely reversible. So no, uh, so, you know, really just uh, as soon as you removed it, the, the methane just picks up again within the next couple of days. We've also, one of the other questions that we ha get asked is, if, if Beauvais has an impact on methane emissions, what happens if I take that manure and I use it in my biogas digesters? It's maybe not as commonly a concern, perhaps in North America, but certainly in Europe, a lot of the manure is going into biogas uh, formation. As Mike explained before, just through the whole mode of action of Beauvais within the rumen, it's actually broken down and metabolized into its constituent parts. So there's no, uh, you won't find Beauvais in, in the excreta. It, we don't find it in the manure, we don't find it in the urine. Um, if we actually done, we've done some studies where we've looked at composting the manure, and we see no difference between manure taken from control or from treated animals, um, it composts as well. Um, we also see we've taken some of the, that manure and put it into uh, BMPs, so these benchtop methane potential reactors, and we see no um, negative effect on uh, methane production if in the biogas. So, all good. And if I just hand back to Mike, he's going to talk a little bit um, on the last two slides. Yeah. And I'm also happy. I, it seems that we are staying well in time. That's that's also good. Oh, no, you can just keep the screen over. I can. Yeah. You can just keep Nicola's screen if you want. Awesome. And then I move. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. No, it's, it's all good. It's all good. Now I need to. Nicola, you should be presenter now. Uh, is it? Who's presenting? Yep, Who's presenting now? It, it should be in Nick. There we go. Yep. There you go, Mike. Now I need to readjust. Sorry. <laughs> Good. Um, so also a great piece of work that was published last year in December, <clears throat> and we thought we put it in here. When you look into feed additives. <clears throat> UC Davis assessed the emission reduction of feed additives in the context of uh, the Californian dairy cattle system. <clears throat> A study that was done by Emias Kebriak and his team, and as I said, published um, at the end of last year. There was a large survey and a full LCA assessment of different feed additives and um, what it means when, when you feed this to um, dairy cattle or dairy cattle in, in um, California. And they were created three groups. Group one is the group of recommended interventions with enough scientific credibility. There is a group two that looks interesting, needs further work. And there is a group three where reduced um, optimism is there that, that it will make a significant impact. Um, we were pleased to see that Beauvais was uh, the only intervention so far put it in 
bucket one. Also, when it comes to the full LCA assessment, the question was raised, how much CO2 equivalent do you produce during producing the feed additive? And how much do you save afterwards by feeding it <clears throat> to ruminants? The underlying question is, if you produce more CO2 than you save at the end, then it's also not a viable intervention. Having said that, the conclusion is, if you feed Bouvet to all dairy cattle in California, 38% methane can be reduced. That was translated into 2.33 billion kilos of CO2 equivalents that will be saved. The reason that uh, you see this high number expressed in kilograms is because you also can compare this then to the kilograms of milk that are produced in California. Greenhouse gas emission footprint of the entire herd will be reduced by 12%. And that would be an equivalent of 0.5% um, of the total greenhouse gas emission in California, which is, uh, of course, number looks not so big, but all the interventions, they add up. So that was, uh, we were highly pleased. DSM was not involved in this study, so we had uh, no say in this. That was purely done on, on available, publicly available data. But of course, um, we were highly pleased to see this, and it shows the impact that Bouvier can have. Good, if we move to the next one, the last slide. Nicola, is it your slide? Is it your, yeah. The, acknowledge the acknowledgements. So you see, this is a huge community of people that contributes to this success, to the development of Bovea. And we are very proud and also moved to have so many um, colleagues and friends working with us around the world. And we thought initially to put all the names up there, but then you risk, of course, to forget somebody and, and uh, also, it gets not readable, so we decided to put the logos of the different institutions there. Sorry, <clears throat> I cannot go through all of them, but I would really like to thank our international community, but also let's not forget the great team that we have at DSM, colleagues that help row with us with the Clean Cow team to get this reality and on the market fighting climate change and also provide a method and an intervention to the agricultural sector to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission. I'd like to just name a few here, people that have helped us starting. So I mentioned already David Gagnez, University of Reading, Chris Reynolds, Karen Bushner and uh, Sean McGinn, um, Alex Hisroff, the team from Arc Research, uh, Peter Janssen, Stefan Mützel, David Pacheco, also at PGDRC, um, the people at Wageningen, Sanne and Andre, um, the, the people in Canada from FHMS, from Riasco, um, the people at Max Planck Institute, Rolf Tower and his team, and I mentioned Eva Duin on the mode of action work. Um, yeah, I mean, a great community, and we would really like um, Cody to thank all the people. We didn't have a picture with all people. The best picture we found is the one that you see on the right hand side. This was taken at the GGAA conference in 2019 in Brazil. And you may recognize, I don't know who joins this, this webinar, but you may recognize uh, familiar faces. And uh, yeah, I see on the right hand side also Emilio Ungerfeld. So with this, I'd like to close here um, and also thank CLOG for the invitation to present this webinar, also a great partner. We are now um, in, in our, we own quite a number of green feed systems by now, so also a, a great collaboration. And I think with this, I'd like to close our presentation and I see perfectly in on time, 6.45, and we are um, happy to take uh, questions until we reach the top of the hour. All right, great. Thanks to both of you for, for the presentations. Uh, we've got about 15 or 16 questions. Uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Um, the first question is, uh, what is the basis of the diet interaction and 3-NOP? Does, uh, does ruminal pH play a role? Nicola, I guess, oh, I 
can I can start with a yep. less ruminant specific question. Methane is produced by the microorganisms that are present in rumen, the archaea. This rumen microbiome is largely driven by the diet of the cow. That's not different from us as humans. Our microbiome in our digestive system is also largely driven by our diet. And it can be changed dramatically if we change, you know, from a from one diet to the other extreme. And therefore, when we start to think about the intervention of free NLP, we need to understand what's the situation of the microorganisms that are producing methane in the archaea. And therefore, and, and there are nice examples where we overlooked this initially and reached methane reduction values that we are not aiming for. And then when we thought through what's, what's, what's the actual situation of the archaea, we realized that uh, already the diet has, has a large effect. And understanding this interaction between diet, the baseline of the archaea, and 3NOP was uh, part of the last four or five years of our research that we get into a predictive model of understanding the dietary ingredients, the daily dose of free NOP, and predict the outcome on methane reduction. But Nicola, maybe you want to add a sentence or two. Uh, and, and I think if um, all the followers of uh, 3NOP and the story of 3NOP, if you've seen the meta-analysis that was done by Jan Dijkstra um, back in 2018, here he um, hypothesized that he did the model and he showed that there was a clear relationship between the dose rate of 3NOP that was being fed and the percentage NDF in the diet. Or Mayas Kibrab's group as well, they've done a lot of work on modeling um, as part of the Global Research Alliance into methane emissions. And one of the key factors that we can see in terms of um, the amount of methane that cow produce can be driven by the amount of NDF in the diet. So for us, yes, I, th I would say that NDF, the content of NDF in the diet is, is really important for us to understand. This is because it will push the amount of methane that's being produced by the cow. We do see also now, we're starting to see a little bit more, a slight correlation as well with starch. Um, we think there's some of that could be down to the pH effect because um, A, it can change some of the methanogens, um, the population of the methanogens, so we might have some more methanosarcina uh, rather than the methanobrevibacter. The brevibacter tend to you know, really uh, rely on the MCR to to produce their methane, whereas methanosocyanate has other routes um, to uh, to be able to produce ATP, etc. So, for this diet, yes, it's important. NDF, I think, is one of the key factors, um, and then yeah, we we are starting to see some starch interactions too. Okay, thanks for those answers. Uh, we did have about 20 more questions come in, so I apologize. We won't get to all of them, but we will pass them on to the presenters uh, to answer them yeah. in private. Um, so we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, the next question is, why the reducing rate is higher in North America than in Europe? And this was at the end of your presentation, Mike, if that helps for the timestamp. Yeah, I don't think that... Um it's really related to the region. What you have seen in this world map, and probably that's where the question is coming from, the 82% was you know, the, the, the top reduction rate. And this goes back also to what I have said before. This was achieved initially almost by accident because we were aiming for lower. But when you think through what happens when you change the diet from a backgrounding diet to the finishing diet in beef cattle, you also change the overall microbiome situation in the beef cattle. And then with this understanding, we know today 3NOP has a higher effect. And therefore, we reach this high methane reduction numbers. But it's not necessary that in North America you can reach higher numbers, which you can't, but which you can reach in Europe. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question is, hello, reducing methane will increase H2. How to deal with that 
increase in the levels of H2 uh, might affect the digestibility and productivity? So as, as I touched on, we've actually done a lot of work now with the new green feed systems that have a hydrogen sensors in there. And yes, if you don't, if your hydrogen is not going um, into methane, then you can have uh, hydrogen accumulation. And the old dogma was that this would basically, if you got a lot of hydrogen being accumulated, this this would just shut down room and fermentation. Um, actually, the cows can they can they can go through this really quite um, easily. What we're seeing is we can get um, you know like a five-fold increase in hydrogen and uh, with no negative effects on performance so you know although we see this accumulation of hydrogen is not as detrimental as you know some of the old literature would have led us to believe we can see some uh, interactions i think maybe on on um, dry matter intake but this is probably more to the fact our hydrogen is trying to go into alternative hydrogen sinks so we find we actually get a lot more propionate being formed um, which then actually tells the cow, hey, I, I've got all this gluconeogenic energy and, and precursor. I don't need to eat as much. And we can sometimes see, you know, like a, a small decrease in dry matter intake. Um, we see hydrogen will also go into forming longer chain fatty acids. So we'll see more butyrate, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, and, and we can't even... We, you know, we can't account for all the hydrogen. Um, we're not quite there yet, but we don't find that negative impact on performance that you know the old literature would have said, oh, no, your rumen's not going to function anymore. It's going to shut down. That is oh. just not the case. Exactly. So we see the positive effect that, uh, that's predictable. Alternative hydrogen sinks, um, very positive effect on uh, VFA data and then also on non-feed efficiency. But that's that's one yeah. of the interesting questions that we are addressing now also in other research programs, but we're getting there. Yeah, and, and I think people also think that, you know, oh my God, I'm going to increase hydrogen and that's going to crash my room and pH. That is not the same thing at all. You know, the 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 hydrogen um, that you see in, in the room and the hydrogen gas is completely different from hydrogen as a proton, um, which causes, um, you know, a drop in pH. With the Beauvais, we actually see an increase in pH, um, which you know some people can't get their head around, but is actually due to this fact. That's also another positive effect there. pH is not dropping compared to control. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, we have a lot of people saying thank you for the presentation. They learned a lot. Um, the next question is, is there an upper dose limit where the reduction effects of Beauvais plateau? So far, we haven't reached this, but we, are, we were also not really trying to reach this. So, so far, um, when we increase the dose, we see, um, and, and you can also, from an academic point of view, ask the question, if you're already at 80%, you know, if you shut it down to 100%, probably a further increase in 300p doesn't help anymore, right? So in vitro tests, clearly, we, we reach 100% methane reduction. We didn't really want to go there because, first of all, let's do this step by step, and also let's not overdo it, because in all our trials, we also didn't want to harm any animal, right? And therefore, we said all our work initially focused on the 30%. If we reach higher values, yes, we are not complaining, but let's do this step by step. We see now publications where, where other people are publishing on interventions and proudly report 98, 99%. Yeah, not sure, but apparently, looks like it also doesn't do any harm to the animal, but we want to reach, we want to stay in a reasonable value. Okay, thanks for that answer. Um, next question, do you have any data on the reducing effects of methane with more than 100 milligrams of 3-NOP per kilogram dry matter? Of course, yes. Nicola so, showed it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, so so we have gone in the dairy. We've gone up to 150. Um, with that, it, there was about a 50% reduction in methane. 
on the beef side, the maximum we've gone up to is uh, 250, maybe 300 milligram per kilogram dry matter. So, you know, we say about having a, a recommended dose rate and, and some of that is just, you know, not to kind of um, go overboard as Mike said, but to try and keep it in a realistic range. So yes, yeah. you can feed more if you want to. Okay. I Thanks think our commercial that. guy would be very happy if everybody fed more, but you know, this is, yeah. The, the more the merrier, yep. Uh, next question, does it have to be fed in the diet throughout the day or can it be split into two different doses? So we have test results, you know, with all kinds of, of um, different interventions. The best results and also to be fit for the feeding system you're operating in is to mix it in the diet so that the cow, whenever the cow eats, green or is present. Because when the cow eats, it also produces most methane. So sometimes we say, actually, we are not dosing the cow, but the feed. Because the more the cow eats, the more methane it produces, but also per definition, the cow takes in more 3 NOP. And in this way, you know, you have this normalized, but to, to the 30 or 40 percent, whatever you want to reach as a as a level. Yeah, and we find with this continuous feeding, we actually match the fermentation profile and the production of methane uh, more closely. That being said, we have done some studies uh, that are published. Um, uh, there's two studies, two different groups now. Um, one from ILVO, where they, instead of putting the 3NOP in the roughage portion, um, so in the forage, that would be like the PMR, they put it in the concentrate and they did a comparison. Um, what we saw there was the animal really had to go to visit the concentrate feeder um, more than five times a day to get the same effect as if you were feeding it continuously in the PMR. Um, on saying that for pastoral based systems, and we've not touched on it in this uh, webinar, but we've shown it in several other webinars, for pastoral based systems where cows are maybe only gonna be coming in to eat, uh, to be milked uh, twice a day, and would, would only be receiving a supplement twice a day, we've been working on slow release farms. And this then can help match the intake of the grass um, coming into the rumen when the animal's grazing, so that we can get and maximize the effects. Because otherwise, what happens is you get a really nice decrease, no methane being uh, emitted from the rumen, but it can only persist for a short period of time because it gets used up. So if you can instead actually just have it almost trickle feeding in on this continuous feeding, then you get a far more stable reduction. So, but we've been working on slow release farms and we can now actually get the same effects that we would have on a, on a TMR system on a slow release farm so that the effects can persist for eight hours. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, like I said, we do have a lot more questions, but I think we're going to have to cut it there. So we will pass these questions on to the presenters so they can answer them. Uh, Maybe I can also just quickly make a remark in, in case of uh, the, the, the slide distribution. If somebody wants to have the slide, the best way is to um, contact us either directly or by C log, right? So that we can uh, take care of this. The other one, just while Nicola was speaking, I was looking at the slide here still with the acknowledgement. I don't know if Chris McSweeney is listening to us and his team because I don't know if I mentioned him at the beginning because he was also CSEO and Chris McSweeney, one of our earliest supporters. Not that I forget this. Okay, well, I'll pass it over to Matt and we'll close out. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Mike and Nicola, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Um, everybody who attends, uh, this webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube page. We'll send out an email uh, with a link to that uh, so you can view it anytime you want in case you missed a uh, part of it or um, you want to watch it again. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, our email is contact at c-lockinc.com. Or you can give us a call at 605-791-5657. And stay tuned because we've got another exciting webinar uh, scheduled for next month. And information on that will be coming out uh, shortly.
So thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining the webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank thanks for the invite. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.